This is Election 2020, New Mexico Senate District 34. I'm Fred Martino. KRWG Public Media and the League of Women Voters are pleased to present today's forum. The rules are simple. Candidates have up to 60 seconds to answer each question and should not mention their opponent in the answer. My co-host is League co-president Eileen Van Wee, and we welcome candidates Darren Kugler and Ron Griggs. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. All right, Thank Darren, uh, first question, we'll start with you. In what ways, if any, should the tax system in New Mexico be reformed? Explain. Oh, well, that's pretty broad open, pretty wide open question, pretty broad question. Um, tax reform that I'd like to see is in some simple things would be um, some accommodations so that benefits are not uh, taxed and also expenses such as uh, now I know, for example, uh, per diem for the um, court interpreters was being taxed as grocery receipts. So the retaxing is the main thing I'd like to see, just as we eliminated uh, some of the regressive aspects of the tax system on food, for example. Um, I would like to see the state adjusted tax roll somehow to not be retaxing benefits or expenses. And um, they thing that's going to take in order to do that is going to be a new income or tax stream and based on our complete failures to generate new tax streams such as uh, the marijuana program which seems to be an agreement on i don't okay. know whether it's practical right now Darren, thank you thank you time ron you know fred the uh, the tax code something we've been talking about for for years and i think you and i've talked about it in the past uh the state initially went after the gross receipts tax, and they wanted to do that in order to keep taxes low uh, and on a variety of things. Well, that's changed. Taxes have gotten higher because so many exemptions have occurred from gross receipts. So we have to look at those exemptions that we gave and look at is there a way to maybe change those as well. We need to, I mean, we're gonna look at lots of things come January because the budget hole is liable to be as much as $2 billion. So can we cut our way out of that? I think we need to work hard at doing that, but I think there's gonna be a lot of things we may need to change. Thank you. Ron, we'll give you this next question first. Should New Mexico continue to tax social security benefits and please explain your answer. The answer would be no. New Mexico doesn't need to continue to tax Social Security benefits, nor should the state tax military retirement. Uh, those two things, though, when you eliminate taxing those, leave you a hole of somewhere between 75 to 120, 25 million dollars in your budget. So when you do them, you've got to figure out, well, all right, can I cut expenses that would at least get me to that? Or am I going to have to look at other things that raise revenues? So we shouldn't do it, but the challenge is going to be how we do it. Darren, how would you answer that? Should we continue to tax Social Security benefits? I alluded a little bit to that in my first answer, so I'll move on a little bit more. Uh, I don't believe we should be taxing the, the benefits. To be taxing benefits is a little bit or a great deal counterproductive. It doesn't keep the money going where it needs to go. Um, I agree that we're going to need additional revenue uh, streams, and I don't see any of those coming. So that leaves the last alternative, which is there's going to be cuts. Uh, I think the estimates we just heard on the whole in the budget are probably optimistic. Uh, the fall is shaping up to be uh, incredibly um, dangerous for COVID outbreaks. And I think that's going to lead to additional reductions in taxes because of uh, our dependence on tourism that's not going to pick up. So I think cuts is where it's going to have to happen. And I think they're going to be awfully brutal. Um, thank you. 
Darren, we'll start with you on uh, this one. Starting pay for teachers nearly 20% lower in New Mexico as compared to districts in El Paso that start at more than $50,000 a year. How do you assess efforts to make the state's salaries more competitive? Uh, I'm pretty pathetic of failure. I'm a child of educators in New Mexico. My uh, mother, unfortunately, took a uh, vow of fertility rather than a vow of poverty. She's one of six boys. We grew up hungry. Uh, she was a teacher and couldn't make enough. We made a divorce. It wasn't nearly enough, and our situation's gotten worse. I'm embarrassed by the salaries that we offer our teachers in New Mexico. With the COVID reality setting in, I would like to see our system change and that teachers be treated like the professionals they are, put on 12-month contracts, and the schools operate in such a way to accommodate um, that 12-month schedules and teachers then have salaries that would be much better because they wouldn't there wouldn't be that lag time and we, I think we'd be better served if we treated teachers as the professionals they are and that's the quickest way to get their salaries up is to switch it to a 12-month contract and with COVID that really is a necessity. Thank you. Ron? You know Fred we have raised teacher salaries substantially the entire time I've been in the Senate. Uh, are they as high as they should be or could be? Arguably they're not. Uh, New Mexico has one of the better, if not the best, retirement programs in the, in the country, however. So when you look at teacher salaries, you look at any of the state salaries, and you have to look at the dollar amount people get paid plus the benefits they have for retirement and the benefits they have for uh, health care and so that are funded by the state. So all in all, it's a good package. It gets evaluated each and every year. And I would imagine it would be something that would be increased again if the money's there, Fred, because this $2 billion hole is going to be going to be a big deal. Thank you. Are you satisfied with how much money was allocated to the Early Childhood Trust Fund in the 2020 legislative session? Explain. I mean, I, I am. I think it was, a, you know, like anything else, it's a good start. Where does it go? We'll have to see. I think the early childhood opportunity that, uh, that we did fund, the things that we did do, I think gives, uh, gives us a chance to really get started and get moving. But however, you know, time will tell. The proof will be in the pudding on a lot of this stuff on what the needs are and how we address them. And did we address them sufficiently with the money we put forward? Thank you, Eileen. Mm -hmm. Darren, how would you answer that question? Um, I'm not going to have a specific answer on the trust fund for last year's allocation. Um, well, regardless of whether it's trust fund or whatever else we're doing, um, children in New Mexico are suffering from the worst conditions in the nation. It's, it's embarrassing that New Mexico has been 50th in so many categories, especially regarding children. And except for Mississippi and Louisiana trading places with us occasionally in 48th and 49th, just the overall outcome for children is horrible. It's, it's almost third world conditions. And we need to really examine what it is we're doing with our children uh, to provide for our children, especially in light of COVID. We are losing a lot of ground and we didn't have that room to give up. Our children in this state are gonna suffer immeasurably for decades if we can't get on track soon. We will continue with third world conditions for our children. I Darren, what was Darren time, time on you. that. I'll move on to the next question. What actions you. do you support uh, to improve the accessibility and quality of health care in New Mexico, if any? Darren? Unfortunately, I think in order to make health care more accessible, we're going to have to give up on more of our regional hospitals. And I hate to say that. I know Northeastern Regional used to be the um, general hospital in Las Vegas has limited what they provide. I think Santa Rosa, in spite of the efforts of the mayor, uh, is probably closed down. 
I think we're going to need to consolidate more of our resources into the bigger cities. And I know that's a NASA to a lot of people from small towns. But Lordsburg, where we first lived when I was growing up, doesn't even have a clinic now. Um, transportation is really the key for the rural areas and providing them access to their rep- the major metropolitan areas that can provide it, being Farmington, Las Cruces, Hobbs, uh, not just Albuquerque. That'd be that's the only option I really think we have because the regional hospitals, the remote areas, it's hard to even keep a clinic open. Thank you. Ron, your thoughts on improving the accessibility and quality of health care in the state? You know, where we are with, with health care is we're behind. Everybody knows it. Uh, the challenge is how do we provide health care mainly to the rural areas? Uh, Alamogordo fits even in, in that category. The, uh, uh, the number of doctors, the number of specialists are, are limited wanting to come to smaller places. What we do have though, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, potentially change the way we do with primary care practitioners, not physicians, but practitioners. And we need to have input from the doctors, from the chiropractors, from uh, nurses on how we can maybe address the need for primary care. And then if we have challenges with uh, uh, specialists, then that maybe can be addressed by the metropolitan areas, but we address the primary care in every area. So thank you, Fred. Thank you. Eileen. Ron, what should the legislature do to improve the New Mexico economy and develop job growth? Oh my goodness. You know, New Mexico has an economic development uh, gross receipts tax. Uh, cities, various cities have those as well in trying to uh, recruit and bring uh, uh, businesses to those communities. But when we talked about earlier, we talked about uh, eliminating the income tax there. Talk about that with uh, military retirement. As we bring those people in or those people don't leave, then opportunities spring up for uh, uh, development of, of jobs in the, uh, in the state. And if we can adjust and we can change our tax structure to make it more friendly to businesses wanting to be here, then I think we have opportunities for the jobs that people are here and we'll bring people with those when they come. So thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Darren, how do you respond to that question to improve the New Mexico it? economy and, and develop job growth? <clears throat> I don't know that we're going to succeed at those. I think we may have to accept the reality that New Mexico is going to have to live, live within the constraints of its water resources, a poor education system, a poor health care system. It's really hard to attract personnel. That was true with Sandia and Los Alamos both. Um, when you work for the courts or the district attorneys, it's really hard to recruit people in New Mexico. Um, I've seen Arizona, Colorado, and Texas just blow past us since the 80s. We suffer from just one boom and bust cycle after another on our real estate and our oil and gas, and those are tied together, and we don't seem to be making any headway. I think like the universities have con- retract- restricted what they're doing, and limited themselves, we as a state may have to accept that that kind of growth isn't going to come. And we haven't been able to do it, and we can't even seem to agree on what areas to promote. And tourism now is fraught with difficulties with COVID. Thank you. Darren, uh, do you favor the legalization of recreational marijuana in New Mexico? Explain. No, I think we should give up on it. We can't seem to get together a scheme that's going to work in spite of us not needing to invent the wheel. We could look what other states have done. We don't seem to be able to do that. I think we should just look at decriminalizing it and then come up with a tax code way to, to address the sale and distribution of it. But if it's the state leading on it, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. They said they were in agreement the last two years. They haven't gotten anything done. Um, tax revenue is being lost to California, Arizona, uh, Colorado, especially Colorado. Um, I mean, 
I hate to, to make it sound this way, but where it's true for eastern New Mexico that they used to drive into Texas to get beer, we would have El Paso drive in Los Cruces to buy marijuana if we could get something together. But I think we should just decriminalize and then take a fresh look at how we're going to structure it. That leave municipalities, counties, others trying to address it, maybe okay. similar to alcohol. I don't know, but All we're right. failing. Thank you. Ron, your thoughts? You know, Fred, I'm not I'm not really high on it. I think what we've got right now with the medical marijuana that almost anybody who needs marijuana for health reasons or or anything else almost uh, can can have access to it. Uh, the estimates for the revenues that it's bringing going to bring in are about one hundred million dollars on the front end. We don't have any rec any uh, uh, idea what it's going to cost on the back end yet right now as we're talking in this interview a revenue stabilization and tax policy committee is hearing a presentation on recreational marijuana and how much money they believe it will provide for the state so those things will be critical the way the bill's written will be critical but just talking about let's just go legalize it I'm not in favor of that, but I do believe if we have a, a bill that's written correctly, we might be able to protect a lot of people if we decide to, to legalize recreational marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. Ron, should it be legal in New Mexico for a physician to assist a patient in dying? And please explain your answer. That bill has come up, uh, I believe, twice already, and is sponsored by uh, Senator DeFonics out of Santa Fe, and I've voted against it each time. I believe that the, um, you know, it, it just is too, it opens too many doors. It is too big a, uh, a step to be able to provide, well, and I guess, Eileen, let's back up for a minute, because the bill itself the bill itself was too open-ended in some ways, and it said that you could get the uh, you could get the uh, drug uh, within 48 hours of, of asking a physician. Uh, the law in Oregon, which has been the gold standard for this type of bill, is two weeks before you can get the bill. So you can at least have time to consider whether you really want to follow through on that sort of activity. Uh, I'm just not in favor of it yet. I mean, I'm not going to tell you my mind can't be changed because I see too many people that struggle, but uh, I'm not I'm not in favor with the bills that have been presented. Thank you, Darren. How do you respond to that question? The state, <clears throat> excuse me, the state of New Mexico is not in a position to try and dictate what should happen between a physician and a patient in almost any regard. Uh, the Oregon standard may be the gold standard, but once again, New Mexico can't seem to get anything done. Um, no other comment. Thank you. Okay, we'll move Thank on you. to the next question then, Darren. We'll start uh, with you on this. Do you support any adjustments to current gun regulations? Explain. Adjustments to current gun regulations. That's pretty wide open. Um, New Mexico's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to live in the second judicial, excuse me, the second congressional district. Uh, the ads I'm seeing on TV about firearms just is bizarre from the congressional representatives. Uh, I was a firearms prosecutor when I was left uh, Deming, and prior to that, I spent five years at Sandia Labs as an international arms dealer. Um, I can't believe how foolish the entire nation is about its gun laws and its inept ability to even understand what's happened with the firearms in our society. Uh, when I used to select jurors, I was dismayed at how ignorant most of our society is about firearms, and that leads to most of the deaths, three out of five gun homicides are suicide. Thank you very much. You. Ron, your thoughts. Uh, do you support any adjustments to current gun regulations? Explain. 
Fred, I don't. I mean, what you've seen recently in the legislature, we've passed red flag laws. Uh, we've passed uh, uh, another gun law the last, last two years. Uh, you know, guns, if you don't use it in a means that is uh, uh, ill-intentioned, uh, the gun's not going to do anything to anybody. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to work on the people in society, help them have the right approaches to uh, to things, and maybe there won't be any issues for this at all. But I, I don't support any additional changes to, to gun laws in New Mexico. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Ron, the next question is, should New Mexico promote renewable energy? If so, how? Right now, New Mexico does promote uh, renewable energy. We, uh, we have tremendous growth in wind and solar across the state. If you look at the, uh, the eastern side of the state primarily, we're, I mean, windmills are popping up left and right. We have, uh, we have a lot of that occurring. The uh, uh, Energy Transition Act, the push with PNM to get them to go to uh, uh, zero carbon footprints and uh, provide all of their energy sources from renewables by certain dates. I mean, those are those are right there. That's what we do in our state. We have to understand that oil and gas is still the uh, the folks that brought you to the dance. And if you cannot figure out ways to help it help us, uh, renewables will, you know, there won't be enough of us here to worry about having renewables. So thank you, Eileen. Darren, how do you respond? Should we be pr promoting renewable energy? Um, the easiest promotion for that is the deregulation. That works in Texas. Texas does not regulate energy, energy development, energy development at all. And as a result, they are the leader now in the nation in wind energy and renewable energy being combination wind and uh, photovoltaic. Um, I don't think they have a lot of hydroelectric, but I'm not sure about that, but they lead in renewable energy. So New Mexico would probably be best served there. It's uh, pretty sad in New Mexico that as much oil and gas development as we have, we suffer regularly from the oil and gas development boom and bust cycles. So at least that is somewhat mitigated from a lot of the renewable uh, sources, not all of them, but many of them. Thank you. Thank you. Darren, what is the role of the state, if any, in abortion regulations? In abortion regulation, okay. Um, the state has a difficult role in that we have a society that seems to have this obsession with um, genitalia of children. And it starts early on in life. Uh, for me, it, it started when I was less than a day old and I was circumcised at the hospital. My mother had six sons and I was the fourth. I was the last one circumcised because she walked in on it. Um, so it's a little personal there because I've heard her story about how she fainted when she walked in on it. My younger brother's not circumcised, neither was my stepfather. My point is, if we're going to get into people's genitalia for showing health, we need to be pretty careful about how we handle that. Roe v. Wade didn't give you give anyone a right to an abortion. It acknowledged our right to privacy. Okay, thank you, Darren. Decisions. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Ron. Okay. Ron, what is the role of the state, if any, in abortion regulation? Currently in New Mexico, abortion is legal up until the date of delivery. Uh, We've had tremendous debates on abortion in committee and on, on the floor. Uh, that sort of thing to me is, uh, a, a, having an abortion is a, is a struggle. My, my wife was adopted, so there's different things that come to me when we talk about this stuff. But, uh, you know, it's a tough deal between a woman and her doctor to decide what's best for her but when we reach that third trimester, we reach that time where, where a little person can live outside the womb. 
responsibility of the state is to stop late term abortion. And uh, I will I will continue to vote for that if that opportunity comes to uh, to the uh, the committees I sit on and on the floor of the Senate. So thank okay. you. For that. Well, thank you. And we thank both of you for joining us. And we also want to thank the League of Women Voters of Southern New Mexico and co-president of the League, Eileen Van Wee, for being my co-host this week. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Fred. It was and, a pleasure. And thank you to both of the candidates. And thank you at home for making public media possible. You'll find much more information about election 2020 at krwg.org. Have a good week.